TNT. And welcome back to Weekends here on TNT. We are having the time of our lives here at the moment. So much development, great news coming through. The world is changing before our very eyes. For those of us asking for a click of the finger and to magically be transported into the new era, whatever that is, we're not quite there yet, but there is something, you know what? It's not about the destination, it's the journey. And the journey this week has taken a remarkable turn that got many of us by surprise. And that is when we refer to Julian Assange being freed at long last and coming home to Australia. Well, when we thought about what was going on and the amount of interviews happening, my production team and myself put our heads together and thought, who's the person that we would like to speak to about this more than anyone else? And there was only one name. Well, let me introduce you to her now. Kathy Vogan is a journalist from Sydney. She's the executive producer at Consortium News, and she has been a courtroom reporter on the Assange hearings. She's also a filmmaker and musician, and she joins me right now. Kathy Vogan, welcome back to Weekends and to TNT. Oh, pleasure to be here, Jason. Absolutely. More than usual. <laughs> this is it, and it's a delight to see your grin bigger than the Lunar Park smile. How did you feel when you got the news? Oh my goodness. Uh, well, look, let's talk about the journey. Uh, three days ago, Joe Laurier, uh, my colleague and I were in London, where we expected to be reporting in the courtroom for Julian Assange's final appeal at the Royal Courts of Justice on the 9th and 10th of July. And we expected that he was going to have a win. The situation had changed. It changed once the judges, and this is something Stella Assange just said very recently, it changed as soon as the judges allowed him to appeal on his free speech rights because there was a not just a possibility but a threat coming from two different people, Mike Pompeo and the prosecutor, the US prosecutor, Gordon Kromberg, that he would likely have no First Amendment protections in a US court. Now, that was a very real possibility because of a long established US law that a foreign citizen who acted abroad is not entitled to First Amendment protection. There is a case in 2020, June 2020, uh, USAID versus Open Society. We've all heard about that, or many of us have heard about that. But, but in fact, in the courtroom more recently, there have been other precedents cited. And the judges, first of all, they acknowledge that the First Amendment, a debate in the courtroom over freedom of speech, that that was central to Julian Assange's defence. They acknowledged that, but being denied First Amendment protection. And why? By way of his nationality alone, right? Because he was an Australian or because he was not an American citizen, he was not protected by the First Amendment. And although the judges in the court, like we're going back years now, they've been ignoring their extradition treaty with the United States, where it is already barred with many other countries to extradite somebody for political offences. They were ignoring that. They were basing everything right back to the extradition hearing in 2020 on the domestic legislation, which didn't mention political offences. It mentions discrimination because of somebody's political opinions, their gender, their religion, their and their nationality, other things as well. And of course, it was loud and clear that this was a red line that the British judges were not going to cross. It was a violation in their Domestic Extradition Act of 2003 of Section 81 A and B. That's where it's clearly spelt out, and they could not do that, and the Americans knew it. And they gave them a chance, right? They asked them, do you want to send us some more assurances, right? You know, he can't be barred from having freedom of speech rights simply because of his nationality. This isn't possible. It's not possible under European law. 
uh, First Amendment equates to Europe's Article 10. And the very first word of Article 10 is everyone is protected. Whereas in the United States, well, you have to be an American citizen or you can be a foreign national residing in the United States, but not someone in Julian Assange's case. A journalist, my God, it was the worst kind of person not to accord freedom of speech rights, First Amendment rights. And so it was a foregone conclusion. And Stella Assange said that the moment that this happened, right, things started to move very, very quickly with a plea agreement. It was the US that got in touch. It was the US that was keen to get this done, right? Mm -hmm. Whereas it had been Australia that had been pushing until then. Okay, so let's get back to the journey that I'm speaking about. Three days ago, we were in Northumberland and we had just climbed to uh, Hadrian's Wall, a very, very strenuous climb for people our age, but we made it to the top. And then we came back down, we caught the train back to London because we had other stories to cover there. And it was after midnight, we were sitting on the balcony, just, you know, having some pate and relaxing. And in our friend's bathroom, he's always got the radio on and Joe went to the fridge and it's always very loud. And he heard Espionage Act and Australia. Those were the two words that he heard. And he went, oh my goodness, that must be about Assange. My goodness, it's on the BBC. It must be a big story. And he comes out with his phone and he says, oh my God, Kathy, Julian has been released. He's, he's on his way. He's left the UK. Uh, we're not going to sleep tonight. And of course, we didn't go to sleep. I was on Mario Naufel's uh, spaces thing for several hours, as was Craig Murray. We were the only ones that they could find because a lot of the other people had already taken off for Australia as well. Stella had left. Joseph had left. Uh, I don't know where Kristen is, actually, but Joe and I, within hours, we were on a plane for Canberra ourselves. And that's the way it happened. And on the plane, thank goodness, we were able to pay for an internet connection. It was of great quality. I'm not going to announce the airline, but it was of really great quality. And we, we just sat there watching the whole thing unfold. We were in the air at the same time as Julian. He was just a couple of hours ahead of us. And he was coming from north of Guam, the Mariana Islands. It's US territory, but it's the closest to Australia. And there was this plea agreement that had been very, very carefully thought out. Uh, the first thing that we saw was Julian and Gareth Pierce. That's a senior lawyer. I don't know if you know Gareth Pierce, but she has a wonderful history. She defended the Guildford Four. She supervised the 150-page High Court submission for Julian Assange, which was summarily rejected by Justice Swift, including the points that the two more senior judges had picked up on and actually won him the case in a way. But the US didn't really want to accept a defeat in court, it's clear. And so they wanted to, you know, deal. Um, so we saw Gareth and Julian, she was finalising these papers, and then he's boarding a plane for the Mariana Islands. I guess that's a lot closer, well, it's a bit closer to where you guys are. I'm in Canberra at the moment, but, uh, you know, I'd never heard of it before. And then he's going into the courtroom. It was all plain sailing in the courtroom. And there were some things that he had to do before the case could progress. He had to pay $100 court fee for some clerical reason. And he also was asked to instruct the current editors of WikiLeaks to delete unpublished material. There's a rumour going around that... He was asked to delete all of the information that was published that he was charged for during the Manning period, 
right? So that's really among the most important WikiLeaks material of all, going back from the State Department cables, the Iraq war logs, the Afghan war diaries, uh, Guantanamo detainee assessment briefs. My goodness, this is a treasure that an archive that we must always hold, right? We weren't so lucky there wasn't such copious material documentation available during the Second World War or even Vietnam, but my goodness, we have it now and that should provide guidelines. No, none of that. He wasn't asked to delete any of that. It was simply material that they had come across at the time from that period, but they had not published And in my view, it's no biggie because it's probably stuff that either they rejected it for the reasons that WikiLeaks had, that had been published before, that it was not of public interest or that it couldn't be authenticated. That's one of the the reasons. Those are the three reasons stuff might have been rejected or else it was simply redacted by WikiLeaks at the time. There were publications that happened later of that material that was redacted by WikiLeaks and the media partners, published by John Young of Cryptome.org, an American citizen who was never indicted for that, and also the Pirate Bay and hundreds of other websites in searchable format. But, you know, goodness knows, oh, yes, we do know why Julian Assange was singled out for selective prosecution. He was told in the courtroom by James Lewis QC, who was the lead prosecutor in the extradition hearing, that it was because Julian WikiLeaks had a very wide reach, punished for his success above American citizens, of course, because they would have First Amendment rights, right? So that all happened, and then it proceeded. Now, last night, I cited, in fact, I read the whole 23 pages of the plea agreement. There are some clauses in there that, um, well, are egregious in my view, and there are others which are okay. But I think I would like to draw your attention, first of all, to what Julian Assange said in the courtroom. Kathy, if you could do that, that would be a really good idea. We're, we're, we're only a, a minute or two away from the break. I think we'll do that, and then we'll take that first break, and then we'll get into the plea agreement. So this is a great time to bring up what Julian said in the courtroom. Yeah. At this time, I'm asking you to explain to me, what is it that you did that will constitute the crime charge? Working as a journalist, I encouraged my source to provide uh, information that was said to be classified uh, in order to publish that information. I believe that the First Amendment uh, protected that activity, but I accept that as written, it's a violation of the Espionage Act statute. So you had certain belief, but you understand what the law actually says as well. I believe the First Amendment and the Espionage Act are in contradiction uh, with each other, Uh, but I accept that uh, that it would be difficult to win such a case in given all the circumstances. It's a very interesting statement, isn't it? Uh, and this, this goes a long way to um, explain to people who may be thinking, well, Julian has always been the pinnacle of whatever this information revolution is that's going by, and others expecting him to have challenged and to defeated, but to take this particular plea agreement uh, for all of the other benefits, such as his health, such as his wife, such as his beautiful boys, etc. And of course, his freedom. Goodness me, how much more does one individual have to contribute to this information war before getting one's own life back. 
And I'm more than impressed by the fact that Julian's still fighting this particular case. There's still the option, I would assume, that uh, I don't know if this is even a case, whether he can be pardoned somewhere in the future for it or even how that would work. Because, of course, uh, later in, the, in our chat today, we will talk about um, possibilities of what we may expect to see from Julian Assange at this point. Will he just uh, disappear into obscurity or will he return uh, reinventing himself to do something else? But one thing's for sure, he'd have to be the hottest interview subject in the world by far. Uh, and all of us are waiting with bated breath to, to listen and to hear and to see what's, what's really going on. But as usual, that man never fails to impress his eloquence, his ability to uh, engage those with thinking minds to realise of the great hoodwink that we've all been living under for so long. Cathy, let's go to our first break. We'll come back. So much more to discuss uh, in this incredible interview about this historical moment uh, for all of us uh, in the, amidst the information war. Listen. Listen up! Now listen, we gotta talk. It's what we do best. This is today's News Talk Radio. TNT. And welcome back to Weekends. My guest this hour is Consortium News' very own Kathy Vogan, and we are talking about this momentous historical occasion of the freedom at long last of Julian Assange. Kathy, before the break, you alluded to the plea agreement. I'm wondering if you can quote from that now, if you will. Well, yes, the first thing was actually Julian Assange's statement. He had been asked how he broke the law, but the actual charge was conspiracy to obtain and disclose national defence information, including classified up to the secret level, right? That was the charge. Now, in his statement, I'd just like to draw attention to the significance of his statement, and I think my colleague Joe Laurie expressed it well. Assange touched on the unconstitutionality inherent in the 1917 Espionage Act in that it criminalises possession and dissemination of defence information, which conflicts with the journalists' First Amendment rights to obtain and publish such material. Technically, Assange was right. His actions, as those of any journalist obtaining and publishing classified information, did violate the Espionage Act because the Act contains no exception for journalists. In other words, he broke the law, but the law is wrong. And this harkens back to how their First Amendment started. It started with the case with a guy called Peter Zenger, who was a publisher as well. And the jury said, yes, he's guilty, but the law is wrong. And so that was the birth of the First Amendment over 300 years ago and the beginning of our right to know. And you don't just get punished for bad-mouthing somebody who's powerful, right? But things are drifting a little bit back that way and there's got to be a stop put to it. Also, as Assange's lawyer, Jennifer Robinson, pointed out in a Canberra press conference, which you may have seen, the Espionage Act could criminalise the everyday actions of other national security journalists if nothing is done to resolve the contradiction. We've just negotiated the return of an Australian citizen from the most powerful country in the world who were prosecuting him for doing journalism. He faced 175 years in prison for publishing evidence of war crimes, human rights violations and corruption, serious wrongdoing by the United States, and that is the basis upon which he was in prison for five and a half years in a high security prison and the basis for his plea. Things have been attempted. In July 2022, the US Congresswoman Rashida Tlaib proposed some sensible amendments that it would be possible to put forward a public interest argument. As with Article 10 in European law, where a balancing act has to be done between so-called harm to national security and the public's need to know, right? There has to be a balancing act of the importance of the information to the public, but not in the Espionage Act. It's strict liability. Did you publish it or not? Yes, you're guilty. And it carries these enormous, enormous sentences, as we have seen with Julian Assange, 175 years. 
But when she did that in July 2022, not much attention was paid at the time. But I think a bit more is being paid now with the outcome of this hearing. So I will just go through some of the details that were in mm. the plea agreement. Um, the plea agreement securing Assange's freedom with a sentence of time served, right? That's what he got, was so he could walk free, was made possible because of the passage of time. The recommended sentence for the offence, the one he pleaded guilty to, which was conspiracy to obtain and disclose US national defence information, including classified to the level of secret, is 42 to 51 months. Now, he spent 62 months in Belmarsh, well exceeding the Australian Prime Minister's declaration that enough is enough. Also, they reasoned, because there has been no evidence of harm done. The agreement plainly states, quote, as of the date of the plea agreement, the United States has not identified any victim qualifying for individual restitution and thus is not requesting an order of restitution. You know, Julian doesn't have to pay any money for money that they paid out to compensate somebody for the damage done. There was no fine imposed on Julian Assange. In fact, he had actually done a year more than the maximum, almost a year more than the maximum time for that offence. So Albo was right to say enough is enough. Just the court fee of $100. No restriction was imposed on Julian Assange's future professional activity. They didn't say he wasn't allowed to be a journalist anymore, in, in other words. And the United States agreed not to pursue him again in relation to the facts of this case. Now, that doesn't mean that they couldn't pursue him again if he proceeds to publish more US classified information. There was a bar placed, however, on any future discovery by Mr. Assange or his representatives. It stated, quote, as part of this plea agreement, and based upon the concessions of the United States in this plea agreement, the defendant knowingly, willingly and voluntarily gives up the right to seek any additional discovery. Further, the defendant knowingly, willingly and voluntarily waives all pending requests for discovery. So the thing is that it was... This was quite a funny moment. I don't know if you saw the Canberra press conference with Stella Assange, Jennifer Robinson. Oh, there was quite a few people who spoke, but Stella Assange was asked about this. And he's neither allowed to make any freedom of information requests regarding the investigation, the prosecution, you know, all the bloody awful things that were done to him. But she turns, this is in the agreement, but she turns to the press gallery and she says, but you can, mm -hmm. and I encourage you to do so. So that was, um, that was quite enlightening and also entertaining. Um, and I hope that, uh, or in fact, I shall be doing that myself. And Joe as well, who is actually an American citizen. We don't work for Julian Assange. Um, so you, I mentioned already about the clause where Assange was to take action, all action, they said, to ensure that unpublished material WikiLeaks had from the Manning era would be erased. It stated, and I'm quoting it exactly now, on return or destruction of information. Before his plea is entered in court, the defendant shall take all action within his control to cause the return to the United States or the destruction of any such unpublished information in his possession, custody or control or that of WikiLeaks or any affiliate of WikiLeaks. The defendant further agrees that if the foregoing obligation requires him to instruct the editors of WikiLeaks to destroy any such information or otherwise cause it to be destroyed, he shall provide the United States 
or cause to be provided to the United States a sworn affidavit confirming the instruction he provided and that he will, in good faith, seek to facilitate compliance with that instruction prior to sentencing. So that was done. Otherwise, proceedings could go ahead. But Julian Assange's American lawyer, Barry Pollock, at the last press conferences, he answered a question about this. Because people were quite concerned. The journalists in the press gallery were quite concerned that these archives had to be deleted. That is not the case. So Barry Pollock replies. Uh, you'd have to ask the United States government why they insisted on including that clause. Uh, the materials that we're talking about are now more than a decade old. Uh, I don't know to what extent any still existed or what possible value they might have. Certainly no national security value. In fact, uh, the United States in court in Saipan yesterday conceded and the judge found that there is no evidence that any harm has befallen <coughs> any individual anywhere in the world as a result of uh, Mr. Assange's publications. That being said, they did insist uh, that he issue an instruction to the editor of WikiLeaks to destroy any uh, materials they might have that were not published, and uh, Julian has complied with that provision and issued that instruction. Now, this clause that I'd like to draw your attention to, this is the one I find particularly egregious. Quote, The defendant agrees and covenants that he and any person or entity acting on his behalf, including as applicable successors and assigns, in brackets, the releasing parties, hereby irrevocably waive any and all rights, claims, demands, suits, causes of action, expenses, damages, judgments, orders and liabilities arising directly or indirectly at law, contract or equity out of the United States Department of Justice's criminal investigation, extradition and or prosecution of the defendant or in connection thereto, which he may now or in any future time be entitled to bring before any competent authority in Australia, the United Kingdom, the United States, or worldwide, and or any court, tribunal, or other judicial body in Australia, the United Kingdom, the United States, or worldwide. You might as well just say worldwide. It goes on. The defendant on behalf of himself and the releasing parties hereby releases and forever discharges all and or any actions, claims, rights, demands and set-offs, whether in this jurisdiction or any other, and whether in law or equity that he ever had, may have, or hereafter can, shall or may have against the United States arising out of or connected with the United States Department of Justice criminal investigation, extradition, and or prosecution of the defendant. Now, if you've read Niels Melser's book, The Trial of Julian Assange, you will understand that he was tortured. He has been treated appallingly. There have been abuses in those courtrooms, and he had to agree to do absolutely nothing about that. That's what I find truly awful. And it was the price of his freedom. It's Kathy, I, I totally agree with what you're saying. That last, uh, that last clause there is, uh, is horrific to think. And when you read it like that, if you read between the lines, it was almost as if the court was saying, you have caught us red-handed. Our behaviour has been more than abhorrent and we are going to cash in the very last of our political or judicial capital to impress upon you that this is over and done with. Be grateful for the small mercy that you've received and go away and leave us alone. And for mine, it says the exact opposite, that now what it's done, it has uh, um, enthused and it has energised uh, real journalists now to take over the reins. And from one will become many, as we can clearly see 
that the US and the powers that be through the spy agencies, etc., around the world, through secrecy, which the old JFK lines, the very idea of secrecy is abhorrent, therefore means that we will not be taking this lying down. Julian, perhaps, is chapter one of the great component of the great movement in this information war. The best part, of course, is that the man is now free, uh, and that means that he can get on with the rest of his life, whichever way it falls. But these are enormous, enormous details, revelations, etc. And thank you also for taking the time to read that plea agreement to sort of iron out some of the kinks, the, uh, the misinformation, if you will, that's being shared online for those that are somehow critical of Julian at this point, thinking that he somehow sold out to gain his freedom. Goodness me, if there's one man that can never, ever, ever be criticised for his actions to make the world a better place, it's Julian Assange. And shame on anyone who thinks that they can be critical at this point. I dare every single one of you to go and serve 24 hours behind the bars under the conditions that he has uh, suffered and then come back to tell your story. Cathy, I'm furious that, that I even have to talk like this, but at the same time, I'm grateful that we can certainly set the record straight. How do you feel, therefore, at this stage, just briefly before we go to our next break, are you as mad as hell as I am that people could actually be negative towards Julian, who are sitting inside and looking at the information more, expecting great change? Well, Julian is on the internet, you know, <laughs> he's like the internet. There's always ways to get around things, and I have some more to say, particularly about some of the lawsuits that are in process at the moment that I believe won't be affected by that last clause. You know, there's a case in the US, there's a case in Ecuador, there's a case in Spain, and there may be a case coming up in the ICC that Julian may be able to testify at. Not for himself, but in relation to torture on third parties. Well, how about that? On that note, don't go anywhere. We're going to continue the discussion after the break with Cathy Vogan. Don't go anywhere. You're watching and listening to Weekends here on TNT. When you need to know what's going on around the world, stay with Weekends with Jason Olborn on today's News Talk TNT. And welcome back to Weekends. This is the final segment of this groundbreaking historical interview, if you will, with Cathy Vogan from Consortium News concerning the release of Julian Assange and the incredible amount of detail that many on social media and in the media have probably skipped upon. So I encourage you, if you've just joined us, to go back and check when this uh, interview will be uploaded to our website, tntradio.live. Simply go to Episodes and then look for Weekends with Jason Olborn. Scroll down and there it will be. Cathy Vogan up in lights as it should be. Cathy, I'm thrilled that you've been able to uh, provide such an amount of information, but before the break, you kind of left us on a bit of a cliffhanger. So Julian may well be able to testify in some cases. I'm kind of thinking that Julian has to be the star witness of all star witnesses. Can you give us a little bit more information about <laughs> what you're thinking? Well, it's just that that last clause that, you know, ensures that Julian would not be able to sue the United States for violation of his human rights, for example. Um, it doesn't mean there are other cases related to Assange that wouldn't be affected by this clause. Um, I mean, what precise impact is for the legal experts? I'm not a lawyer, but it's hard to see how that clause could impede any lawsuit against the heinous extrajudicial activity of the CIA. The appeal judges, Sharp and Johnson, these are the senior ones, said their kidnap or kill plan had nothing to do with this case, right? Yeah, of course. But you also have Yahoo News that reported that the plan was hatched before Assange was even charged with anything and the judicial process was launched to shut the crazies down. Right. That's kind of the relationship. The other relationship was that there was testimony in the key testimony in the extradition hearing from Maureen Baird, who was a special administrative measures. This is the most torturous of incarceration. They never see a soul for the rest of their days. She was an administrator of that. And guess who advised the Bureau of Prisons on who should get Sam's? 
Well, the CIA, but the judges didn't seem to know that. But I was being facetious when I said the judges said that their kidnap or kill plan had nothing to do with this case, right? So nor should the clause, um, that clause impact on the Fourth Amendment case in the Southern District of New York brought against the CIA by American citizens who were spied on while visiting the embassy and quite possibly beyond giving the tracking information that was obtained. They took photos of their IMEI numbers, which is the unique number of a phone. And from that, you can, those people, I don't think Judge Cottle, who was hearing that case, and he's a very, very good judge, um, I don't think he quite grasped that, but these people could be tracked outside of the embassy and right back to their their own homes. And also, I have read, but I've never done it myself, even though I'm quite technical, I'm just telling you that I have read that if you have the savvy and the IMEI number, you can clone the phone. And so the CIA could have gone on spying on those people. There are two lawyers and there are two journalists who are suing the CIA over that for violation of their Fourth Amendment rights. And that is no illegal search and seizure. You know, get a warrant, right? There was no warrant. So that case will, I'm sure, proceed. Then we have Assange versus Ecuador, right? Another case in progress, which not many people know about, um, which may be partially affected because the US was involved, but not in relation to Ecuador's breach of its own constitution and its international obligations. Ecuador, ha in its constitution, it does not extradite or expose, um, it does not extradite its own citizens. You, you recall that um, Moreno, Lenin Moreno, who was the president, the awful president after Rafael Correa, who had given Assange asylum in the Ecuadorian embassy. Well, you know, he made it into what Stella Assange called a black site. Julian was cut off the internet. All the staff were changed. It was really quite frightening what was going on there. So, you know, and in the constitution, Julian was supposed to enjoy that's the actual word they use, enjoy his asylum. But Lenin Moreno had announced that his citizenship was cancelled. That was a lie. We interviewed Carlos Poveda like only about nine or ten months ago, and that still wasn't settled. You can't cancel somebody's citizenship overnight, uh, and their asylum, right, overnight without due process. The person, the victim of that has got the right to say, no, I argue that I haven't done anything to deserve this, etc., etc. So there are aspects of that that will continue. Then there's the Spanish case against David Morales, the head of UC Global, the company that spied on Assange in the Ecuadorian embassy. Now, that is the state against Morales. It's related to Assange. You've had somebody like, uh, you've had Craig Murray, who many people will know, who's done some excellent courtroom reporting. I advise you to go to his blog, craigmurray.org, uh, all one word, Craig Murray. He foresaw that the US case was going to collapse. Um, oh, like a couple of months before it did. Um, very, very good writing by Craig. So Craig testified, has testified in that finally. He was a little bit impeded. I won't go into the reason why, but that's going ahead as well. Now, the other thing is that the Department of Justice, they declared that there was a Chinese wall that distances the Department of Justice from the CIA. In other words, what the CIA obtained was not handed over. So, you know, they've distanced themselves from that can of worms and therefore that's got nothing to do with this clause either. Where Assange may be able to testify is at the ICC in relation to CIA torture of third parties at black sites. The 150 page High Court appeal submission goes into some detail about that, complaining that a sentence beyond 
his natural lifetime would impede, would actually prevent Assange from testifying about US torture, which they call in the appeal document a Jews cogens. Prohibition. Which means that it is outlawed in every court in the world. Can this now be done? Wait and see. Absolutely, we'll wait and see. It's uh, extraordinary to think that um, all roads lead to the CIA and this agency is the... Um, it's kind of like the uh, the smoke and mirrors that's lent upon by the Department of Justice, the US government and others around the world to hide all indiscretions. And clearly Julian versus the CIA, if it will, in the ICC, uh, could well be the, 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 the one event that blows the lid once and for all. But at the same time, if the US government um, uh, doesn't um, uh, sign up to the ICC, does this case or could this case have any merit at all? It's not Julian versus the CIA at the ICC. Julian would just be a witness because Mm. there were documents that showed the torture in the releases by WikiLeaks. Mm. So Julian would only be a witness that testifies as to the authenticity of these documents that show CIA torture. It's not him who's actually bringing the case. Sure. No, that's an important detail there. But of course, you know, people are questioning what's going on. So I'm glad we cleared that up. Now, we've only got a, a handful of minutes left. And I, I know there's so much ground to cover, but I was hoping that we could um, just have a look forward at this point. Is there any indication of Julian himself uh, looking to, to grants uh, at any agency an interview at this stage? Has there been any development there? Stella said that Julian... His only plan is to swim in the sea every day. And uh, today he ate, I think it was, uh, you know, the Good Morning Show or something like that. He ate good bread with real butter. He's, you know, he's eating good food again. He's enjoying his boys. I'm sure, you know, it's really interesting because um, I spent a little bit of time with Julian's two boys mostly Gabriel, the oldest one, who was attempting to take the batteries out of my camera while I was filming the surround parliament event. And I was calling him a cheeky little monkey. But um, I'd seen him a little bit before that, and he was saying to his younger brother, let's go on an adventure. And I just imagined that that's what Julian said to his boys probably the next day after he arrived. I've heard that they've gone to the beach. Julian really needs time to recover. He's been in a black hole for five years, in isolation for 23 hours a day. Look, even Albo doesn't know when Julian is going to be ready to speak again. And Stella, his wife, has simply asked that we give him some time to heal. But I wouldn't expect him to get into it yet. I mean, look, as you were mentioning earlier on, I don't know if it was before we started, there have been some people still saying outrageous things, like he's not even a journalist. My God, this guy has won over 30 awards for journalism, right? Mm. And this kind of crap is being put out by the Murdoch press. Murdoch, how many awards has he won for journalism? A big fat zero, right? He hands out awards to his staff members, of course. Oh, good job, well done, you published that bullshit. Um, But, you know, that's one of the things. And the State Department were even still trying to say that he put people at risk. Well, no, because in the courtroom, in the plea agreement... Once it is disseminated, it look, I just got hold of it as a journalist last night. People haven't read it yet in in all this detail. There are 23 pages because it hasn't been widely disseminated yet. But read it carefully. Read what the judges said. And as Barry Pollock, Julian's lawyer, said, some of the things that are being said by the State Department have got nothing to do with what was said in the... Mariana Islands courtroom. So, but you will, you know, it's all there in black and white. Thank you. Should Julian heal, and as you said, take some time, 
is he entitled to be paid a substantial amount of money to have an interview so that he can at least rebuild his life? Do you think that's valid? Well, I should think so. You know, the interview is worth what people want to pay. I imagine that, that they might be, you know, there might be rivalry. <coughs> Will Channel 7 get it first? Will it be Channel 10? Um, I'm sure that, um, you know, there's a good chance he could be offered money. My God, they charged him $520,000 for the plane, for his ride home. Mm. <laughs> uh, I mean, I don't see why Australia, didn't, I think they may have advanced the money for the charter because it, he wasn't allowed to go on a domestic flight, you know, with other people. I don't know why, maybe flight risk or something. They wanted everything to be completed. So it had to be a charter and it was over half a million dollars. And that bill is for Julian. Um, Stella has started a fundraiser for that. So, you know, good luck to him. If um, I think there have been very generous donations like there were for Chelsea Manning when they finally let her out of prison. Um, you know, the grand jury story where they wanted her to testify against Assange. They hit her with an enormous bill for every day that she wouldn't, she was compelled to speak and she wouldn't do it. She said, I told you everything in 2012. But, you know, I hope that Julian gets all that money as quickly as possible to clear that debt. And this really is a fresh start for him. Now, we're down to our last minute. And just quickly, before we uh, let you go, Cathy, what's next for Cathy Vogan? How do you take a breath and recharge your batteries? Oh, goodness gracious. Well, I go to sleep every night, I suppose, most nights. <laughs> um, I, you know, remember the older president's men? Remember when you were hungry? Mm. Well, I'm always hungry. <laughs> <laughs> I love it, Cathy. The work that you have done, uh, and not just uh, just over this short period of time to bring us all up to speed, this incredible interview today is something that we should all look up to uh, in, in, in the field of endeavour that we choose to work in. It is exemplary. I can't thank you enough for the time that you've provided us here at TNT and the wider audience in the wonderful work that you do. So a wonderful big round of applause and, and, and thank you today, Cathy. You're welcome. Thank just, you, just, just remarkable. Well, that concludes the weekend, and I am delighted that everyone could uh, come along for the ride once again. Don't go anywhere. The fun continues after the break. You are watching and listening to TNT Radio.